Chapter 16. This chapter is all about the oceans. We start with a case study, the collapse of cod fisheries. So cod has been a super important part of the United States in its history. When the colonists came to the United States, they realized that there was a huge wealth of cod millions and millions of cod here off the coast of New England and then up here in the Canadian colonies they also had huge amounts of cod. It created the wealth of early United States. It funded the Revolutionary War, the wealth of cod. If you go to Boston or other New England you can still see references to cod everywhere. It was an important, important industry. What happened after World War II was the invention of new fishing techniques, including sonar, which helped fishermen identify where cod was. And then you had a lot of foreign boats coming in from other countries to these fishing grounds. And they overfished it so rapidly in a couple of decades that the entire cod population collapsed. And so we have a little bit of that on sticky notes here on the next page. This is page 421. <clears throat> Go ahead and pause the video and copy that down. Turning to the next page, page 422, we have the ocean and we have some parts of the ocean. Some other information that you're going to learn in this chapter is going to refer to things like a continental shelf. So really, you kind of really just need to know what the continental shelf is. And, in, and we already learned in chapter two, the mid-ocean ridge and the volcanic island arcs. The rest of these three, you don't really have to know, but do know what a continental shelf is. So the continental, the continent extends out into the ocean where then it steeply drops. On the west coast, we have a very short continental shelf, so off our coast it gets deep rather quickly. In the east coast, so if you go to North Carolina to the beach, or Atlanta, um, Georgia, or New Jersey to the beach, it has a very long continental shelf, so you can walk out very far um, and still not be over your head with water on the east coast. Ocean salinity is part of the range of tolerance for organisms. So on average, ocean water is about 3.5% salt. We sometimes call that 35 parts per thousand. So that's just a, a type of term um, that we use when we study salinity in the ocean. We'll say it's the parts per thousand. And this should be average. I forgot an A there. Now. This is the average. It's going to be higher or lower depending on where you're at. Salinity is lower near the equator because it has more freshwater rain that dilutes the salt. So a little bit lower, maybe 33 parts per thousand. So not super low. It's very high at our latitude at between 30 and 35 degrees north and south latitude um, because it evaporates at this area. Um, we are at 35 degrees north um, latitude and so off our coast, further off the coast, so directly on the coast, you're going to have less salinity because freshwater rivers run into the ocean and dilute it right directly off the coast. But you go a couple miles off the coast and you're going to have higher salinity because of evaporation. And we don't get a lot of rain, but we get more heat and evaporation. Something that you studied in chemistry was heat capacity of water, and water moderates temperature. You know, in Santa Clarita, when it's a super hot day and we drive to Ventura to go to the beach or Carpinteria, it's the temperature there. It can be 100 here in Santa Clarita and 70 in Carpinteria. And that has to do with water's high heat capacity. The colder water makes it colder on land. So coastal cities have more moderate temperatures, less cold and less hot on the coast. On the next page, 424, we have a picture of the ocean's currents. Let's talk about here, this sticky note here. Note where the currents are coming from, the equator or the poles, to see if it's a warm or cold current. 
So on your exam, you will have a question that will talk about this current, com this current, and this current, and this current, and it will say which um, next to these pieces of land, so which coast is going to be cooler or warmer. And so what you want to do is you want to look at the current that's next to it. And so our coastal cities in California are going to be cooler than our coastal city over here in New Jersey or North Carolina because our water comes from Alaska. So it's coming from the poles. So it's colder water, which means it's going to create a cooler temperature inland. This is why our water is so cold in California. You go to the East Coast, Florida, and it's coming from here. It's coming from the equator. And so it's warm water. And then the Gulf Stream shoots that warm water over here to North, Northern Europe. And so even though London is so far north, if you look at the latitude, it's very far north, it has a mild temperatures um, because of the Gulf Stream bringing warm water up here. <clears throat> so if you're asked a question, oh, let's go back to here. So off in the East Coast, if you've ever been to Florida or the Carolinas or New Jersey in the summer, you'll notice the coastal towns are not that cool because the water is not that cool off the coast. But our coastal towns in California are very cool in the summer because the water's coming from the poles. So on a test question, just be aware of where the currents are coming from. You don't need to memorize the currents. Maybe the Gulf Stream, you should know the Gulf Stream, but the rest of them you don't need to memorize. You just need to take a look at where it's coming from. If it's coming from the North or South Pole, it's colder water. If it's coming from the equator, it's warmer water. It's going to make the land warmer or colder well, as well. So that's what we talk about here. So ocean currents, or the we also call ocean currents the ocean conveyor belt, carry heat throughout the world. When currents change, it can have a big impact on global climate change, especially in coastal regions. So if the water warms up off the coast of California, our coastal communities are going to feel warmer. Um, and global climate change, we always talk about global warming, but in some locations it's going to be a little bit colder too. And that's because some of the currents will change. We will study more about that in chapter 18. So you can pause the video as needed. Going on to 425, up here we have upwelling and there's steps in upwelling. We will talk more about upwelling um, in class when we do El Nino notes. But do make sure that you look at this picture, that you read the picture, the figure and caption, and as it talks about how um, the Coriolis effect, which is the spin of the earth, diverts currents out and then cold water from below comes up to replace it. So anywhere you have upwelling, you're going to have a lot of life because all the nutrients are at the bottom and all the light is at the top. So when you have upwelling, all these nutrients that sink to the bottom from dead things or sediments come up to the surface, to the fluid zone. And then the producers in the ocean, phytoplankton, algae, kelp, all can use these nutrients and the light for photosynthesis. So you begin the food chain that way. So because of upwelling, most life in the ocean is near the coasts and the photic zone because of photosynthesis. So both of these things are essential for life. Then sometimes you have downwelling where you have the opposite thing occur and this is where you don't have much life because of downwelling. Down here we also show the deep, surf, the deep water currents called thermohaline and this is why in the poles people, you know, can still live. It's not in other words, up in London or up in Canada, it's still livable because the currents um, in the ocean take the heated water from the equator and transport it to super cold areas. So it warms up those areas a little bit to make it habitable. So make sure you understand that. Turning the page to 426. So we have our figure and captions for El Nino. We will do an exercise in class to help you understand El Nino more, but please take a moment to understand these 
pictures and then the caption and the reading down here to study El Nino from the book and then from our diagrams that we're going to do in class so the combination will help you understand El Nino. Page 426. So now we're into marine biomes. So 16.2 is marine biomes. So marine means the ocean, not all water. So we talk about fresh water and then ocean water and marine refers to the oceans. So in marine biomes are algae. So we can have microalgae, which are little microorganisms that photosynthesize. We can have macroalgae, which is big, that you can see it from the naked eye. So seaweed and, um, I spelled that wrong, seaweed, not seaweed, um, and kelp. So kelp is kind of the official term for seaweed, but um, that's macroalgae. They photosynthesize with plankton. So phytoplankton and, and algae photosynthesize in marine biomes. These things mostly are phytoplankton and microalgae supply most of the Earth's oxygen. They also take in CO2 in the ocean. Down here also on this page under my sticky note are some terms. So you need to know the photic zone and the benthic zone. Photic zone is the light zone. Remember we studied this earlier. Red light penetrates the least and blue penetrates the most down in the ocean. And then the word benthic means bottom. So we'll use that term benthic. Page 427 talks about the intertidal zone. So when we go to the beach off our coast, sometimes there's tide pools. And you can see tide pools, and at low tide you can go and explore them. We have uh, some in Carpinteria that's very popular with Santa Clarita folk. They can go out at low tide and see the critters that are in here. So know this figure and caption about the intertidal zone. That's what we call tide pools. We call it the intertidal zone. And so these species are, this is the harshest environment in the ocean because you have waves crashing all the time and sometimes it's hot with full sun and dry and sometimes it's cold with ocean water and very wet. And so you have to be a species that's adapted to both. Um, hot and dry, cold and wet, and waves crashing. And so um, it's a very, very highly adapted ecosystem. The next page talks about ocean acidification, page 428. So we have this picture here, it's quite a lovely picture about how this occurs. So we release carbon dioxide and mainly from um, burning fossil fuels, but some other ways as well. It reacts in the ocean forming carbonic acid, which then can um, dissolve the shells of critters that are made out of calcium carbonate it can also prevent these critters from creating shells as well. So what you need to know here, this is page 429, is that CO2 from burning fossil fuels dissolves in ocean water. It reacts to make carbonic acid, which is H2CO3. This lowers the pH in the ocean. It lowers it a little bit. So the normal pH of the ocean is about eight, and right now it's lowered about 0.1, 0.2 which is enough to make a difference. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it's enough to make a difference. So it's not gonna feel acidic to humans because it's technically still a basic, but it's creating, a more, it's creating more acid and it's affecting our life currently in the ocean. So corals and other critters made out of calcium carbonate begin to dissolve or they cannot put on mass in their shells. So those are the two things. We'll continue on with the next video.